rank and title with such brilliant minds as Captain D, Morgan, Kangaroo, Crunch, and my favorite, Captain America. He is the True Crime Garage's very own Captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Cheers, mates. Today we are drinking Flannel Mouth by Blake's Hard Cider Company up in beautiful Michigan, garage grade 4 out of 5 bottle caps. Flannel Mouth is made with 100% Michigan grown apples, and they use a wide array of late season table and dessert apples, this combination giving it a sweet flavor that finishes incredibly smooth. And Blake's Hard Cider, they have several ciders to choose from including seasonals, but on the old Blake sweet to dry scale. I chose flannel mouth because it falls right in the middle, so not too sweet and certainly not too dry. Those apples must have worms in them. And this refreshing drink was brought to us by these fine Americans. First up, we have Annie in Portland, Oregon. Keep Portland weird. Down in Kentucky, we have Brittany, who says she's stalking the captain on social media. So watch your back, my friend. Well, just remember, Brittany, there's a block button. And next, we want to give a big thank you to John and Amanda who are celebrating Independence Day in beautiful Parts Unknown America. All right. And just a reminder for those that are studying computer, the computer labs in Parts Unknown will be shut down all of July 4th. Next up, we have Patrick in Southeastern Massachusetts. Patrick says he is impressed with our work and appreciates the effort, dedication, and tact. So some very nice words from Mr. Patrick. And all the way from San Mateo, California, we have Kevin. Cheers to you, mate. And last but not least, one of my favorite cities, we have Jamie in Dallas, Texas. Jamie says, I can't get through the week without the captain and Nick. All right. Thanks, everybody, for donating to the Beer Fund. Make sure you're patient. Yeah, and if you'd like to donate to the Beer Fund, go to truecrimegarage.com. Click on the Donate button. I know the captain already beat me to the punch there, but we would like to wish everybody a very happy and safe 4th of July. And thank you to the men and women of the armed forces for their service and sacrifice. This captain is one of my absolute favorite holidays. I love seeing all the American flags out. I love celebrating by filling up the old cooler and, mm-hmm. you know, some American brews fire up the grill. Watch the fireworks. America. It still manages to surprise me that at this time each year, we get to hear about some NFL player suffering a firework related injury that they could. <laughs> That they cause themselves. So, unfortunately, that's something we'll probably hear within the next few days. But everybody out there, be safe and have a happy 4th of July. And drink responsibly. And that's enough for the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This is True Crime Garage. And this is the case of Madeline McCann. We're just hearing that a search is underway for a three-year-old British girl who's gone missing in the Algarve area of Portugal, and she went missing last night. Hundreds of people have been searching for the girl, and that search continuing this morning. So we will try to get as much on that as for, for you as soon as we can, uh, that uh, missing girl in Lutz, and we will bring it to you as soon as we get further detail. Well, they're still hopeful that this is simply a a case where a girl has gone missing, left her apartment uh, and maybe asleep on a tree. But that said, Colin, it's quite some time now since she went missing. It was at 10 p.m. last night that the little girl, Madeline McCann, her parents, Jerry and Katie, uh, were out for dinner. They got back to their uh, their, uh, self-contained apartment uh, and she wasn't there. They do have two other younger children, but uh, three-year-old Madeline was not there. A search was uh, was started in the Ocean Club Resort. Uh, staff and guests at the resort searched it until 4.30 this morning. Uh, the search has resumed this morning, but as yet, nothing. This is uh, the Ocean Club Resort in Praia del Luz, 
in the Western Algarve. As you say, it's run by com the company Mark Warner, which is described as a sort of upmarket, all-inclusive package holiday. Uh, uh, these are self-contained villas. It's actually in a small town, uh, but it is self-contained uh, with, with, with a cordon around it. So, so perhaps she is still within the cordon, but as I say, it's some time now since she went missing. Presumably, Mark, they'll, Mark Warner, have a, a, a presence out there in the Algarve, and presumably they'll be doing uh, or making sure they've got people, if they're not out there already, heading that way to liaise with the police and obviously try and help the family as best they can because, of course, these first few hours are absolutely critical in this search, aren't they? Absolutely, they are, they are indeed. Uh, and and the, the, the UK Foreign Office is working with local police. Uh, local airports have been informed, so the search is, is widening. But as I say, the, the, uh, the, the manager here who I spoke to says he still is hopeful that this will be resolved, uh, that, that she will be found soon. disappearance now of Madeleine McCann, the three-year-old girl who went missing while on holiday in Portugal. On the line is a local resident, Mark McCarrick, who is one of those helping in this search for little Madeleine. Mark, thanks very much indeed for speaking to us today. It's a, a dreadful cliche to talk about every parent's worst nightmare, but that is precisely what we're talking about here, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, mean, I just got up this morning and, and, uh, and heard it on the news, uh, but apparently the, 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 the child went missing last night. So we have had this, this search been going on since 10 o'clock last night, right the way through. So obviously now, and obviously there's more local residents come out to, to, to lend a hand. How many people are involved, Mark? What's the area that's been covered? What are people searching? Well, they, they, they're covering the, the beaches, the, the, the pools. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's quite tight around here, so there's a lot of apartment blocks and townhouses and people searching gardens. Uh, the response has been tremendous. And the area around Luj, we're looking at a map of Portugal at the moment, placing it on the southern coast there in the Algarve. What kind of area are we talking about there? Well, actually, where, where, the, where the, the child's got missing is from the, from the Ocean Club, and it's, it's maybe about two minutes from the, from the beach. Uh, so, as I say, there's a big, uh, big coastline. People have walked along there. They've had the, the, the dogs out. Uh, as I say, we're just all keeping our fingers crossed. I've just had a little bit of information from some of the people at the Ocean Club. Uh, the, the, the parents were actually at the, the restaurant, the tapas bar, which is actually on the complex, and the children were actually in the, the apartment or the townhouse by themselves. They've actually had the, the, the door ajar, so they, they kept looking over. The parents have been going over, checking on everything. So I think it, it's, it's a bit positive that, obviously, we, with the door being open, maybe, maybe little Maddie's just walked out and obviously gone missing. We're just hearing, actually, Mark, from the Press Association here in the UK. Uh, they're telling us a bit more about the family concerned. Uh, Madeline apparently lives with her parents, Gerald, the father who's a doctor, and Kate McCann, uh, the younger siblings uh, as well, all, all from Rossley in Leicestershire. Uh, a neighbour there quoted as saying that, uh, as you might expect, we're absolutely devastated. A really nice family, good neighbours as well. Uh, we see them take their bikes up and down, going for walks. It's understood, according to neighbours, that Madeline was uh, due to start at school in September. Um, what are the local media making of all this, Mark? How much attention is this getting out there? There's, there's people starting to come down now with cameras. They haven't actually, obviously, spoken to any, any of them, but I think, uh, I think the main concern is obviously all getting out and, and finding her. Uh, they have actually got representatives here from the from, from Mark Warner, just uh, just obviously filling the, the local press in. But I mean, I haven't really got into that because I've basically we're just getting flyers and getting them around the shops and, and walking on the beaches. And the main concern is obviously all getting out and, and finding her. Gerald McCann, better known as Jerry, met Kate Healy in Glasgow in 1993. They got married in 1998. Both are physicians. In May of 2003, they had their first baby, Madeline Beth McCann. In February of 2005, they were blessed with twins, Sean and Emily, and Madeline became a big sister. In 2007, the McCanns were excited to take a vacation with some of their longtime friends to the Algarve region of Portugal. Joining the McCanns on this trip were David and Fiona Payne with their two children and Fiona's mother, Diane Webster. 
also on the trip were Matt and Rachel Oldfield and their child. The last family of the group is Russell O'Brien and Jane Tanner with their two children, a trip consisting of nine adults and eight children. On Thursday, May 3rd, 2007, the McCanns are enjoying their sixth day of their week-long vacation at Praia de Luge Resort. At 10 a.m., parents Jerry and Kate McCann place their daughter Madeline and her younger twin siblings in the Ocean Club's Kids Club while they go for a walk. 12.30 p.m., Kate and Jerry collect their children from the Kids Club and went to their apartment to have lunch. After lunch, they will go to the Ocean Club swimming pool. At 2.29 p.m., the last photograph of Madeline is taken. This is of her at the pool. The camera clock reads 1.29 p.m., but the McCann family would later say that the clock was off by one hour. At 3.30 p.m., Jerry and Kate McCann return the children to the kids' club. At 6 p.m., Kate McCann gets her kids from the kids' club and takes the children back to the apartment while Jerry goes to an hour-long tennis lesson. Around this time, the McCann's friends, the other seven adults on this trip, who would later be known as the Top of Seven, are having tea at the resort's cafe. According to what we can see on the security cameras, the three men of the group leave the cafe around 6.30 p.m. The four ladies leave shortly after. Just after 6.30 p.m., David Payne goes to the tennis courts to talk to Jerry McCann. Jerry asks David to go check on Kate and the children at the apartment. After the tennis lesson, at 7 p.m., Jerry returns to the apartment and the McCanns put their children to bed in the front bedroom of the apartment. Madeline is in a single bed nearest the door. There is an empty bed against the opposite wall beneath the only window in the room. Between the two beds are two travel cots. This is where the twins slept. The parents kept the window and the shutter in the bedroom closed and the door to the room almost all of the way closed. Once the kids had gone to sleep, the McCanns get ready to go out to dinner with their friends. After a shower and a change of clothes, Jerry and Kate enjoy some wine together. 8.35 p.m. Jerry and Kate McCann are the first couple of the group to arrive at the Tapas restaurant, which is located at the resort just about 50 meters away from the McCann's apartment. At 8.55 p.m., the group has ordered starters when the routine of checking on the children begins. Matt Oldfield goes to check on his own apartment. He also tells the Paynes, who are still in their apartment, that the group is waiting for them at the restaurant. 9.05 p.m. Jerry McCann returns to the apartment through the unlocked patio doors to check on the children. Earlier that week, the McCanns had used a key to go in through the front door next to the children's bedroom. But worrying the noise might wake the children, they began using the patio doors. The patio doors can only be locked and unlocked from the inside. So on this night, they were leaving them unlocked. Jerry entered the apartment and sees that the children's bedroom door, which they always left slightly ajar, is now open to 45 degrees. Thinking this is odd, he glances into his own bedroom to see if Madeline has gone into the parents' bed. She is not. He sees that all three of his children are still asleep, right where he and his wife had left them. Closing the door again almost all of the way, like they had done earlier, Jerry then went to the restroom before leaving the apartment. On his way back to the tapas bar and restaurant, this is at 9.08 p.m., Jerry sees Jeremy Wilkins, another guest at the resort. Jerry stops and speaks with him. The two men spend several minutes talking. Shortly after, Jane Tanner, who had recently left the Tapas restaurant to check on her own children, she walks up the road. She is not seen by Jerry McCann or the gentleman he is speaking with, but she says she sees them. After passing the two men, she sees a man walking quickly across the road in front of her. The man is walking 
in a direction leading him away from the McCann apartment and heading toward the outer road of the resort complex. He is carrying what she described as a sleeping girl in pink pajamas. The little girl appears to be limp in his arms. The sighting is odd, but hardly an exceptional sighting at a holiday resort. She then arrives at her apartment. Everything is fine. So she returns to the Tapas Bar and Restaurant. p.m. It is Kate's turn to get up and make the next check on her children, but instead Matt Oldfield and Russell O'Brien are checking on their children as well. So Matt offers to check on the McCann's kids while he is away from the table. In the McCann's apartment, Matt notices the children's bedroom door is open, but this means nothing to him. He observes all is quiet and simply glances inside the kids' bedroom seeing the twins in their cot. From his angle, he says he does not directly see Madeline or her bed from the doorway. 10 o'clock p.m. Kate goes and checks on the children. She enters the apartment through the unlocked patio doors. Once back in her apartment, she heads towards the children's bedroom Before she gets there, the door to the children's bedroom blows shut. Kate opens the door. Inside the room, she quickly noticed the bedroom window is open and the shutter is up. She sees the twins. The twins are sleeping in their cots in the middle of the room. She looks to her left and she is surprised to see that her daughter Madeline's bed is empty. Kate quickly checks the apartment, but she sees no sign of Madeline. She leaves the apartment and runs to the Tapas bar. The group sees her running up, and she's screaming. They have taken her. 10.30. Just after 10 p.m., Rachel Oldfield goes to Jane Tanner's apartment and tells her Madeline is missing. Jane Tanner tells Rachel, Oh my God saw a man carrying a little girl. Sometime around 10, 10 p.m., Jerry McCann tells Matt Oldfield to go to the resort's reception desk and call the police. Matt does so, and the police are called. 10.30 p.m., the local police arrive on the scene. At 11.10 p.m., detectives arrive having been contacted by the police. The detectives are told there has been a child abduction. A very large search is underway for the missing girl. Resort staff members, guests of the resort, and police are searching the resort, the beach, and the surrounding areas. They find nothing. Around 4 a.m., the search for Madeline is called off. 10.30 True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Madeline McCann. Captain, before the search for Madeline McCann was called off about 4, 4.30 in the morning, you know, a lot would take place before then. We have the police arriving. Mm -hmm. We have later detectives arriving. We have a weird situation, though, here, in my opinion, because we got kind of two things going on. If I'm an officer and I'm arriving to the scene, what am I witnessing? What am I experiencing? Well, I'm experiencing two things, and they're a bit of of opposites, if you ask me. First off, we have the McCanns and we have their group of friends stating that Madeline has been abducted and that we need to be looking for her and looking for her abductor. At the same time, we have the hotel staff. Well, I say hotel, I should say resort. I apologize. But the resort staff, they're saying that we have a missing girl, that she probably wandered off. 
Well, that that's problems though for 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 many different reasons, right? Right. Okay. So, what direction am I going to take this? Who do I trust here? Do I trust the McCanns? These are well-to-do people. They're both physicians, smart people here traveling with their friends. Their friends are smart, educated people as well. Yeah, foreigners. Yeah. So, do I trust these people and believe that we're looking at an abduction, or do I go with the experience of the resort staff? telling me that we have a little girl that's wandered off. This has happened before, and we know it's happened before because the resort staff is, says, you know, this this sort of thing happens here, uh, but we've always managed to find the little boy or little girl that's gone missing. Well, a couple things. So, one, the McCains are going on with the theory that, no, the kid didn't just wander off because this window was open and it wasn't open before. Therefore, there's some evidence that somebody came in Mm -hmm. and possibly abducted her. That's their theory. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there was a motive as far as the resort goes to go, hey, no, chances are nobody broke into the apartment and she just went missing and we're going to find her. No big deal because it's bad for business. Well, it's bad for business and I get what you're saying there, but at the same time, I think I think we got they're going off of experience. We've experienced this before. And this has always been the resort, the, the, the result, I'm sorry, <laughs> that somebody's always just wandered off and we found them later. Now, we said that there was a search going on. This was, was quite a big search. You had about 60, I believe it was 60 of the resort staff uh, looking for the little girl. We also had several of the guests staying at the resort looking for her as well. There's one resort uh, employee that stated, you know, there were so many people looking for her within this area that you could stand on one side of the property and hear the people from the other side of the property calling out her name. Now, after a short period of time, we see that the the detectives are called in because, yes, we might have an abduction here. And this is going to start off with, well, we need to interview. We need to question the parents and their friends to get a good idea, a good sense of what took place that evening. That's why we spent so much time earlier going through that timeline, and we'll dive into that a little bit more later. But but first off, one thing that, that was strange to me is that when, when first confronted by the police and detectives, uh, this is outside in, in an open area of the mm-hmm. resort, open air area. The, um, the husband, the father, Jerry McCann, he throws himself down on the ground and he's obviously very distraught that his daughter is missing, but the, the detectives immediately got kind of a weird vibe about what they were witnessing. Right. Almost like they thought he was putting on some kind of act. Well, what made, what would further their suspicions is that later when they were with the McCann's back at the apartment, both of them together almost repeated the same display right? where they throw themselves kind of down on their knees. They're almost in a, in a begging un, uh, you almost know, like a praying motion. Yeah. It, it's hysteric. You mm-hmm. know, they're, they're obviously they've lost their daughter. One would expect people to be very upset, but again, we have seasoned detectives getting an odd feeling about this behavior by, First, the husband, and then by both parents. The other thing that's odd here is that, you know, Kate McCain, she claims that the window was open. And when the detectives in the, uh, arrive to the scene, the, it's there's kind of a misconception. Uh, and this is a very blurry area. Some detectives have made statements saying the window was not open when we arrived there. Right. And then that that would lead to a lot of there's a lot of questions about the window. Mm -hmm. But Uh, but the other thing here, too, though, is that we also have a lot of people now in what is possibly a crime scene. Correct. And so we have a bunch of people going in and tracking in their footprints and people put, you know, touching things and, and, and putting fingerprints everywhere. So this is, you know, they should have roped this off from the beginning. The thing that I've heard here reported, and you're right, if the McCanns and their friends are right and and it was an abduction from that apartment, then you're you're exactly right. That whole apartment is a crime scene. I've heard that there's been twenty or plus twenty plus people in that apartment that night 
Uh, and, and I don't know, I don't have a full understanding if that includes investigators and police officers mm-hmm. or if that's on in addition to. Like I said, when you have the resorts stating, hey, this is probably just a girl that got up on her own and, and took off. That's not, you know, I think you need to prepare for the worst. Mm-hmm. And if they would have prepared for the worst, they would have blocked off that area. They would have had to give them another room and said, look, we just got to shut down this this scene what was another thing that happened that night captain we have the the whole group that there is there on vacation together we have we said we have nine adults and eight children yeah a lot of people call them the tab is seven uh but i i like to use the bbc's reference they call them the tab is nine that includes all the adults that were on vacation together. Including the McCanns as well. Right. So what they did was they had the group sit down, and because it is a bit of a convoluted uh, situation of different people getting up at different times to go check on children and check on other people's children, um, we have a lot of moving pieces and parts there. So they do have the group sit down, and I believe using Madeline's own activity book or some kind of notebook that she had, they use that to kind of write down a general timeline of that evening about who was doing what and when so they could try to maybe track down and figure out what time the little girl went missing. Yeah, that that was very loose and very rough. They wouldn't, they wouldn't actually sit down with law enforcement to actually go over the details of that night for about seven days. Mm-hmm. And again, in this case, if we want to assume the worst, then we we need to remove these individuals, uh, you know, again, assume the worst, remove these individuals, question them a little bit harder that night. And separately as well. Mm -hmm. And like you said, what they put together was kind of a rough, very general, vague copy of what what had gone down that night. Mm -hmm. And then later we have a situation where individually their, their times are a little skewed from that they they each one of them has different things to report because they you know witness things separately that evening um but the problem we have here one thing i found um terribly uh troubling when when we were researching this case is is the timeline itself not only do we have the varying accounts by the different invi- individuals in the tapas 7 or tapas 9 uh if you include the mccanns but we also have depending on what publication you would read because some of the publications would get very vague with them as well. They they seem to me like they would round things to eight o'clock or round things to eight thirty, rather than by going going to a minute by a minute account of what actually went down. Yeah, and what's going to happen is that we have the tap is nine. They have a timeline, and then the resort has a timeline that is off by about thirty minutes. Mm-hmm. The other interesting thing here is that UK has a very they have very strict laws on child neglect and so a lot of people when you look into this case go well why were these nine adults uh, 50 meters away you know from their children and in these unlocked apartments in a foreign town so like i stated before the tapas nine would be questioned about a week after the weird thing here for me is that their stories don't even line up with each other's that well and why i find that weird is because they were saying that they were taking these turns every 30 minutes. Well, if you're doing something every 30 minutes, then you're checking your your watch a lot more. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people now have said, well, they're on vacation and they're having some drinks, so they're not really checking time, and that's why there's some inconsistencies. But if you are checking on your children every 30 minutes, then you're probably well more aware of the time. We'll get right back to this after this quick beer break. Support for today's show comes from Audible. Audible content includes unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, and business information providers. I use Audible every week to listen to my favorite books. I'm truly addicted to Audible, Captain. I, I get a new book, at least a new one every month, mm-hmm. and I I just tear through them really quickly because it's very entertaining. Tear through them with your ears. Unlike a streaming or rental service, with Audible, you own your books, so you can access them anytime, anywhere, from almost any device, including your iPhone, iPad, Android, Amazon Fire tablets, or Windows phone. 
Plus, thanks to the great listen guarantee, if you don't like your title, you can swap it out for a new one. Not to mention, Audible Channels gives you a collection of exclusive originals, short stories, and comedy, so you always have something new to listen to. I am currently listening to A Devil's Knot. I've listened to it before, but I'm revisiting it. I think I've listened to that one myself at least twice. So check out Audible. Find all of your favorite books there. Get a free audio book with a 30-day trial at audible.com slash garage. That's www.audible.com slash garage for your free audio book with a 30-day trial. That's audible.com slash garage. There's so much to discuss here, Captain. It would be easy to get off the tracks. And before we get too much into the McCann's and the rest of their group, let's go through and talk about some of the possibilities, right? Because, you know, we said the search was called off at 4, 4.30 a.m. That, that morning, but the search started quickly after that. It started the next morning after police were able to regroup and organize a better search with larger numbers of people, mm -hmm. searching a larger area, bringing in some dogs, setting up roadblocks. There was a lot of stuff that happened the following day, and that didn't turn up any sign of Madeline as well. Unfortunately, it took several days before they were, uh, Interpol had announced that, you know, anywhere traveling outside of the country, they were on high alert for a missing girl as well. So this quickly became, and Madeline McCann quickly became probably the most famous missing person in a very, very long time. Yeah, I think somebody, I heard somewhere that maybe she was the most, uh, reproduced photo of of the decade. Yeah, yeah, I read that as well. So what are some possibilities of why Madeline had disappeared? And let's talk about this because this situation, right, we have a missing child, so it's easy. There, there's not too many possibilities when you really look at it in the broad sense of things. You have what I think of as three possibilities. And, of course, each of these they certainly come with their own set of questions, right? right. So, so let's let's start with the resorts theory. The resorts theory is that she got up, noticed that her parents weren't around, and she took off to look for them. Right, right. So Madeline has gone missing because of Madeline. Like mm -hmm. you said, she woke up, wandered off, and eventually leading to her disappearance and or death. Right. Well, she's three, almost four, so I'm not going to put any responsibility uh, you know, on her. The other thing, too, is like, again, the thing that makes a lot of parents angry is why would you why would you leave your kids? Uh, you know, especially when they had this like daycare that they could have sent them to. But that was fifteen dollars an hour. But maybe you're too cheap. So, you know, we're going to take turns. Look, I've heard a lot of rumors that uh, people in the UK are a little more loose as parents. Uh, I, I don't again, I, I don't think it's acceptable. So. We're going to go off this theory, but we have this extensive search and nothing comes up. And I think the only possibility that this could still be true is if somehow she traveled very far and hit water and and died in the water. And they, that's how they never found her. But to me, there's not a lot of evidence that this is this one of these theories is actually uh, what happened. Well, and I, I like where you're going with this, and I have to agree, and I have some of my own reasons to top that off, right? So I thought about this a lot. If if she woke up and wandered off, where would a child go? Well, mm -hmm. I think she probably most likely would go look for her parents or go look for something fun. Um, these two things make sense to me. If she woke up and didn't find her parents in, in their bedroom or in the apartment, it's certainly conceivable that she left the apartment looking for them. Mm -hmm. If she would have went out the front door, uh, one of the directions she could have gone would have led her right to the main entrance. There would have been a receptionist there. Um, there would have been somebody, some form of staff working there. She would have been located very quickly. Well, no, that depends. it depends on which way you go. If she went out the front door and she took a right, then she's just going off into into the countryside. If she takes a left, then yeah, she's going to go into the front, but there's no lobby. She doesn't have to pass through a lobby. 
Correct. And what I meant by that is if she were to go basically any other direction other than traveling along the wall of the resort, if she left the front door, right. that would almost, that forces her into the street. She's a small child. I'm, I'm going off of what I think is likely here. I think she would have stayed along that resort area and that would have led her to the main entrance. If she went, if in fact she went out the front door. Or here's a, this gives us a good opportunity to actually talk about the layout. So first, when we're talking about this wall, the whole resort basically is walled off, but now it's not secure. It's not like you need some uh, security pass to get into the different parts of the resort. Correct. And so if we want to think about this, so the let's just look at the apartment first. The apartment that they're staying in, 5A, uh, has an apartment above it, but when you look at the front door... You have a front door, and then to the right, you have a window. And that would be the room that Madeline and the twins would be sleeping in. If we go to the back of the apartment, we have a sliding glass door that lets you into the apartment. Now, if I'm on that patio, there is steps leading down to the street, and we have that wall that kind of secures the, the, the resort premise. Mm-hmm. And then if you're on that patio, I will be able to look out, and I see a pool and past that pool is where the uh, the tapas club is. So when the when the tapas nine are eating and drinking, they can only see the back of the apartments. They can only see where the sliding glass doors were. Mm-hmm. And I tell you what, Captain, I do have to. I might have to disagree with you on that, but I don't think we should get to it that too much at this moment. The thing here is, you know, wait, we, hold on, just be clear. You want to disagree with me that you can see. The sliding glass door. Correct. Right. Right. No, but what I meant by that is, yeah, because that's something that people dispute. But if you're behind the pool in the Tapas Club, if you were if you were able to see any of the, the doors, gotcha. you'd only be able to see the sliding glass doors. What I'm stating is you could not see any part of the front of the building. Gotcha. So you're, I got what you're saying. You're sitting right. at the restaurant table. You look past the pool. You're seeing the back part of that entire apartment right, building. See, you're, right, seeing you're seeing the seeing patios. The, the patios, the balconies. Okay. So the thing here is we have uh, we have a situation where the the, the Tapas group mm-hmm. they they've requested this table and this table was poolside and we've been told that they requested this table because they wanted to be able to see their apartments. Right. You know that they intended to sit out each evening and have dinner and drinks together at 8.30 and reserve this table for their entire group with the thought, like we said, that they could view or keep an eye, a close eye somewhat on their apartments. Yeah, and it's it's 50 meters. So I look, it's it's not an extreme distance, but still, you know, the fact that they're leaving doors unlocked and you're in a foreign country, it's, it's not responsible parenting. So if she wakes up frightened or if she wakes up confused and goes off looking for people or mom and dad, regardless, it's it's a, it's sad to think about, you know, regardless of anything happening to her, it's sad to think about a small child waking up being confused or frightened and looking for mom and dad and not finding them immediately. Um, you know, if no one interfered with her, if no, if she wandered off and nobody interfered with her, I really think she would have been found found alive. Uh, the chief investigator here called the search one of the largest searches for a missing child in Portugal history. Mm-hmm. Um, so this really seems like a very, very unlikely possibility, leading us to possibility number two. That would be that she was abducted by a stranger, someone unknown to her and unknown to the McCann family. This would lead me to some immediate questions I would have about this second possibility, right? One would this be a target or a random abduction Two, how would the abductor know that there is a child in the apartment unattended mm-hmm. three, how would the abductor move in and out of the apartment undetected or move the child unnoticed? Um, you know, he or she is not seen that we, that we know of um, what route would that, would that make them take? Well, we do have an individual that was seen carrying a child. Mm hmm. And four, was the abductor a woman, a man, or was this a group or some kind of organized uh, abduction? And like w- what we stated before, on May 3rd, they 
you know, the police show up and you have the family saying our child was abducted and you have the resort saying, no, she probably just went missing on her own. She went out the door and we'll find her. But now that we've done this extensive search, the police have no other choice but to go, hey, this abduction thing probably makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. And that would lead us to what would probably be their first lead, the sighting of the man carrying the girl. This was the sighting done by Jane Tanner, uh, one of the the Tapas group. Mm -hmm. So the, remember. Well, let's let's just go through her story real quick because we kind of went through the McCain story. But her story, and we're just going to start from the major point. She's at dinner. She's drinking. Um, This is at the point where Jerry has already checked on the kids. He's checked on the kids. He's leaving the apartment. He goes down to the street. He sees a guy that he's played tennis with. He's talking with this individual on the right-hand side of the street. It's pretty dark. And Jerry even says, there's nobody out. There's, Mm -hmm. There's no motion, nothing. So their friend... Tanner goes to check on her kids and to check on, I think, somebody else's kids. She walks down the same street as them on the left-hand side. They're on the right-hand side. Now, she says, I saw them. I saw both of them talking. Now, neither one of those gentlemen, Jerry nor the other guy, said that they saw her. But she passes them on the left-hand side. And as she gets, uh, she's going around to the front of the apartment. And as she's going around to the front of the apartment, before she turns left to go in front of the apartment, she sees a guy carrying a child, maybe three, four-year-old girl uh, wearing pink or light pink pajamas. Mm-hmm. And she she doesn't think much about it. And then the guy goes across the street and she goes up to the apartment. So that's, that's the sighting. Now, the two individuals, uh, Jerry and the guy he was talking to about tennis, not only did they not see Tanner, but they didn't see this gentleman that she saw. Mm-hmm. So Tanner describes this sighting and the man as not as being not far from Madeline's bedroom. He was heading east away from the front of apartment 5A. Mm-hmm. The child in the man's arms, he she is wearing a light pink pajamas with floral pattern and cuffs on the legs. This is similar to what Madeline was wearing that night. And she described the man as white, Dark haired, about five foot seven inches tall, 35 to 40 years old. He appeared to her to be Southern European or maybe Mediterranean. This guy was wearing gold or beige pants and a dark colored jacket. Now, later, an artist impression was made of the man that, that Tanner saw. Mm-hmm. This was not released until October of 2007. Now, in the picture, in the artist rendering, it, it actually appears that we said a dark colored jacket, but according to the artist, it appears like it's possibly a dark brown. That's what it looks to me. Um, and she said that he did not he, he did not look like a tourist to her. She thought he was somebody that was a local. Mm-hmm. Um, this description is what many call the Tanner sighting. Uh, this description, like we said, was not released to the media uh, for three weeks. The drawing was conducted in October 2007, but the description itself was not released to the media until three weeks into the investigation. Of course, if the child in the man's arms is in fact Madeline, then the course, the the direction that he is taking, the, the direction he is traveling is of great importance. But in the early days of the investigation, the direction in which he was walking was thought to be extremely important because the man spotted carrying the child was heading in the direction of the home of Robert Marat. This is a 33 year old British Portuguese businessman. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's living near where the McCann's were staying. So near apartment five a, and he's a suspect at that time. Okay. So of course here, captain, it looks like maybe that's why the police were not releasing the description of the man because they already have a suspect that somewhat matches that description traveling in a direction of his home. And the, and the tap is uh, nine. They all made statements saying that, that Robert was seen around the resort, uh, but also seen around the resort that night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the sighting was also considered to be very important because it offered investigators a time frame for the actual abduction itself. Now the, um, the thing here though, captain is that the later, 
they identify the man that was carrying this child. Uh, this is in October. It's not until October of 2013 that Scotland Yard said that a man on vacation has been identified as the man carrying the child that Tanner saw. Well, and this, just to stop you before you go any further, let's just start off with the idea that this happened in 2007 and now we're talking 2013. Mm -hmm. The man was the man that they identified was in fact carrying his daughter back to their apartment that they were staying in. The girl's pajamas that she was wearing that night matched the description that was given. Scotland Yard took photographs of the man wearing the same clothes to the one that he was wearing that night mm -hmm. and posed about the same way, according to Scotland Yard. So they believe they've identified the man, and he frankly was just carrying his, his daughter back to their room, so the sighting itself, it, even though the detectives at the time that night didn't believe Tanner had seen anything at all. We have a situation where she did in fact see what she said she saw because they identified the man and they rule that he has absolutely nothing to do with the abduction of Maddie. Right. With, which will also point to the fact that we have this guy, Robert that uh, lives with his mother and, and the Tabas nine said they saw him around and see the first day of the search, he was around and he was helping out with the search. And so then it became, okay, this is our prime suspect. But there was really no evidence other than the fact that maybe this guy could have been the guy carrying the kid and it was heading into the direction of his uh, mother's house. Uh, again, no evidence. And eventually they cleared this gentleman. Well, let's let's expand on that a bit, because you, you actually have three members of the group uh, that was traveling with the McCanns mm -hmm. that said that they saw Marat outside of apartment 5A. And this is shortly after the disappearance. There's also a bunch of other people that spotted him as well. We have an Ocean Club nanny. We have two guests that were on vacation. We have a barrister and a local woman. All these people seeing him. Uh, his claim is, and his mother backs him up on this, he says that he was home all of that night. Right. So this wasn't until May 15th, but they did, like you said, they did an extensive investigation into this guy. Mm -hmm. uh, his home and cars were searched. This included his computers and phone. They drained his uh, pool. They mm -hmm. searched his yard using ground radar and dogs, and they questioned people who knew him. Um, but like the captain said, they had cleared this guy, but I wanted to go into how extensive they looked into him. The thing here is, though, you know, they questioned him. They questioned people that knew him. I want to be clear, though. They continued to question him years after they quote unquote cleared him. Um, they questioned his wife years after. And in fact, they questioned his mother as late as this year. And one of the things that she stated in, in some of the things she witnessed that evening was what she referred to as suspicious activity that she saw that night. And the thing here is she, I mean, she might be right because that Marat home where they lived was only about 150 yards from apartment 5a mm -hmm. she told the bbc that she had driven past apartment 5a that night and had seen a young woman in a plum colored shirt just outside of the apartment uh she did give this information to police at the time um she also said that she saw a small brown rental car speeding toward the apartment and she only noticed it because the vehicle was going the wrong way down a one-way street so Robert was pretty much the number one suspect from the, or the first number one suspect. Correct. Right. And then we have the, like we said, we have the Tanner sighting, you know, their friend that saw this guy, you know, a guy carrying, you know, what some people believe was his daughter. My problem with that is the direction he was heading in was away from the apartments. What she claims. I agree was, with you. And then the other thing that I have a problem with this too is uh they, they basically claim that he was picking up the kid from the child service and and that's kind of how they figured this all out but again it's six years later and i, I i'm not a hundred percent i i hundred i don't a hundred percent believe that this is the gentleman that 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 tanner saw i'm with you because what i kept looking for when researching this exact sighting here was that all I could ever find was it was Scotland Yard saying that we have identified this man as being as being who 
Gene Tanner saw that night. Mm-hmm. I couldn't find any definitive thing where she's saying, yes, that was the guy that I saw that night. So leave some question there, right? But we also have a sighting uh, that occurred a little bit later that evening. This mm-hmm. would be around 10 o'clock, and this is referred to as the Smith sighting. Right. So we have the Tanner sighting and about 30 minutes later. Now, give or take, I mean, like I said, with timeline, always go back 10 minutes or forward 10 minutes. But about 30 minutes later, um, the, the Smith family sees a man in similar outfit carrying a, a, a young female. Yes, this is Martin and Mary Smith. They are on vacation as well. Uh, they're from Ireland. I, I like this this sighting a little better. I find it a little more, maybe a little more credibility here just because there's more than one person stating the same thing. They're saying that at around 10 p.m., about 500 yards away from the McCann's apartment, walking away from the Ocean Club toward the beach, Uh, They spotted a man. He was carrying a little girl that the Smiths believed to be about three to four years old. The little girl had blonde hair, pale skin, wearing light colored pajamas, no socks or shoes or slippers. She was barefoot. Um, The Smiths believed that the man would have been in his mid thirties, approximately five foot seven to five foot nine inches tall with a slim to normal build. They reported him as having short brown hair, Uh, This guy was wearing cream or beige colored pants, and they said as well that uh, he did not look like a tourist to them. According to the Smiths, he had he seemed uncomfortable carrying the the little girl. Right. And my my argument there on not believing that they identified uh, the man that Tanner saw is that if if you carried a three year old, almost a four year old for over 500 yards, so over five five football fields, you're going to be pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. If it, if it's in fact the same two people and you know, we've heard people say that it's not possible. The time doesn't line up. No, Mm -hmm. we're talking about 30 to 45 minutes later, a guy wearing a similar outfit is carrying a similar girl Mm -hmm. with the similar outfit on. And it's what were we captain? We're now we're 500 guards out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, something like that, but it's roughly about a quarter mile. So you got to make a quarter mile in 30 minutes. Not that hard. It doesn't seem hard to me. Um, The thing here is we have a a composite drawing of this guy, uh, the description that was given by the Smiths. This was released. It's it's called an E-Fit. It was Mm -hmm. released by Scotland Yard in 2013. It's basically a a computerized uh, uh, drawing of what they think they believe. So there's two pictures of this guy, both looking somewhat similar and captain. I there's, there's so many things that are similar about the two sightings. The one that I'd say is a a big thing that, you know, kind of sticks out in my head is Tanner claims that the gentleman had a little bit longer hair Mm -hmm. and, and the Smiths clear clearly state that his hair was not long, very short hair. Um, and the thing here is captain, I, I found some, i I thought that the, the, the man in the E fit picture Mm -hmm. that the Smith saw, it's a vague resemblance, but it, to me, it vaguely resembles Jerry McCann, um, vaguely resembles almost any European male. Oh, it, it, yeah. It looks like a lot of people. All right. So since we're on the Smith sighting. Let, let's just go ahead and discuss this a little bit because uh, we're we're kind of jumping back and forth as far as like you know time frame you know two thousand seven two thousand thirteen. At some point years after, the Smith family uh, sees a BBC reporting and they see uh, Jerry McCain carrying one of his twins, mm-hmm. and they are convinced that the I believe the gentleman um, and the Smith family was saying sixty to eighty percent sure. That the guy I saw that night, now we're talking years later, was Jerry McCain. Now, then that threw up these big red flags, right? That- right. And I think they're saying that because this is Martin Smith saying this. Mm-hmm. He's saying it because, like the captain said, he sees Jerry on TV. He sees him hold not only holding his, his other child, but he's, his head is kind of down. His shoulders are kind of up. He's almost in a similar position that he would have seen that man that evening. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, wow, man, when I see him in that stance, when I see him with his head, just that certain way, 
this 60 to 80 percent that that's my guy that that's the guy that i saw walking that night carrying a child right so again when we first start this whole thing when uh kate comes out running and saying they abducted her they took me you know they took my daughter right mm-hmm. we have the resort saying no no she probably just rent went and left on her own and we'll find her they don't find her so now we're going with this abduction theory but there's these little things that don't keep you know that they're not adding up like you know uh we get this really weird feeling with, with jerry so we have these these things not quite adding up. So now we we're, we're kind of splitting off into two theories. Mm-hmm. One that somebody abducted her or that there was an accident or, or somebody killed her and to cover it up, they're claiming that she was abducted. And so when you have the Smith family coming out saying, okay, now we know who we saw that night. It was Jerry McCain. Now, the problem with that was even the, I believe, even the Portuguese police told them, hey, look, based off of the timeline and not just, and not just the, the Tapas Nines theories, but based off the resort's timeline and what they saw, there is no way that you could have seen Jerry carrying uh, Madeline that night. Yeah, and that's that's the troubling thing with the investigation. When the, when the investigation kicks off, they're they're already stumbled by the fact that Madeline could have wandered off, and then they're further stumbled by we have the whole group stating it's an abduction. Let's look at that. And the third possibility, like you said, is that this is some kind of cover cover up. Something happened to where they had to cover up the death of their daughter. And now we have the, and that's why she's missing. The thing here is that was not really, did that seem to you like that most of the investigators from the beginning thought that that was a possibility, thought it was the number one possibility? No. It it looked to me like they were checking the other avenues first. All right. So here, here's where we're at though, right? So now, now we got two theories, right? That either she's abducted. Or that the McCain's had something to do with it and that it's a cover up. Well, and therein lies, Captain, what I would call the the bulk of the story, the bulk of this investigation is the family, the McCann's themselves. We all know that they've become suspects in, in the disappearance of their daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem here is, you know, this is a 10 year old case. And yeah, I know we cover a lot of 10, 15, 20, 30 year old cases. This case is different in the sense that it is, like we said, she is probably the most famous. Madeline McCann is probably the most famous missing person, maybe in the history of, mm-hmm. of you know, these types of cases. That being said, everything has been under a microscope. If we went through everything through the course of this 10 year investigation, it would take us a whole season just to talk about everything that's taken place. Let's what do I, it. Starting no, now. No, no what, starting I, now. what I think the, the thing that we need mm-hmm. to hone in on and focus in on, and we're going to have to do this on tomorrow's show, but what we're going to do is there's been a lot of theories. There's been a lot of speculation. There's been a lot of suspicion around the McCann family. There's a lot, of, but, but every couple months or so, we get new leads and we get new evidence. Mm-hmm. I think what we do is I think we, we kind of pour through that evidence and we point out if if this does this point towards a guilty or a not guilty in in our opinions yeah and I, I think you'll be able to see how weird our brains work uh, when we look at the evidence so of course the whole world 10 years later is still looking for madeline madeline mccann tomorrow captain you and i will look for the truth about what happened that night all right everybody happy fourth of july and i, I don't even care where you're from Happy 4th of July. Get some fireworks out. 